This review was made possible by contributions from viewers like you. It's the most wonderful time of the year. With the studios cash grabbing and copyright flagging for reasons unclear. It's the most wonderful time of the year. They're the dumb, dumbest movies they sell. All the holiday tripe that makes me want to gripe seriously, what the hell? They're the dumb, dumbest movies they sell. Oh, why me? There'll be movies for riffing, comics for nitpicking, of course it must be a Bob show. There'll be bad animation, ducks talking, damnation, and plots that you cannot follow. What the hell's going on? It's the most wonderful time of the year. I might be misbehaving, but I've got my raven under mistletoe. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Hey guys. My executive producers have spoken, and they've decided that today I'm going to review The Swan Princess Christmas. Merry Christmas to me. But first, a little background. The Swan Princess was released in 1994, and it told the bland, generic story of a forgettable prince who has to save a beautiful but equally forgettable princess from an evil sorcerer whose plan involved taking over her kingdom somehow by turning her into a swan. It was also based on the ballet by Pyotr Tchaikovsky, which is weird since not a shred of Tchaikovsky's music is used in it. It was directed by Richard Rich, who you may remember as the director of Alpha and Omega 1 through 5. I, however, will always remember him as one of the three directors of The Fox and the Hound, and would later do Alpha and Omega 1 through 5. He was also an assistant director on The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, The Small One, Robin Hood. What happened to this guy? We like to joke about Disney being a soulless corporate entity that's just out to make money, but only under the yoke of Disney was Richard Rich making mainstream work that wasn't complete garbage. It's clear that Rich just isn't going to stop, so please, Disney, I implore you, get the man under your control again so maybe he could do more good for this world. Anyway, The Swan Princess got a theatrical sequel in 1997, a direct-to-video sequel in 1998, and that seems to have been the end of that. And then today's movie, The Swan Princess Christmas, was released in 2012. I mean... Really? You have properties like The Land Before Time, which stayed in the public eye because a new sequel was coming out more or less every year or so. That I can understand. Who was asking for The Swan Princess to come back 14 years after its last movie had long been dead and buried? Nah, uh, whatever. Like The Land Before Time, It'll be refreshing to revisit this old franchise and enjoy the dying art form of traditional hand-drawn animation. What the hell is that? Ah, Christmas traditions. Candy canes. Presents. New inventions to make the season bright. Yes. They made the leap from 2D to 3D. And in that leap, they did not stick the landing. Granted, this opening sequence with this manservant named Rogers isn't too bad, but trust me, the movie's barely begun. Yes, we have all the usual traditions. Well, you shouldn't. You should only have traditions that are specific to your own country and time period. Do you wrap Christmas presents that also include riddles on them to make it look like they were given by the Riddler? I doubt it! He explains that one tradition in his kingdom is hanging the royal Christmas tree with ornaments that symbolize good memories. Okay, that's an interesting way to theme one's Christmas tree. Remembering good times, always room to make new memories. Oh look, there's a small child mourning the loss of her parents. Good times. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh. And then we smash cut to a jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rap. This is gonna suck. 
After getting reacquainted with our heroes, Prince Derek, Princess Odette, Speed the Turtle, Puffin the Puffin, and Jean Bob. Jean Bob. Not Jean Pierre. Not Jean Luc. Not Jean Valjean. Not even Jean Robert. Jean Bob! We then cut to this ratty-looking cat, simply named Number Nine. He's talking to the ghost of Rothbard, the sorcerer from the first movie, who promises to give him more lives if Number Nine can help Rothbard come back to life first. Number Nine! Ah! Oh! Oh! A little warning, Rothbard, please! Seriously, that's the cat's first line in the movie. Most other movies would try to build up the suspense of their dead villain trying to come back to life, but... Nah. Just say that he's back within the first five minutes of the movie. That's fine. It's also worth pointing out that Rothbard hasn't been a threat to our heroes since he was killed off, but he's being brought back to life in this movie because, as has been discussed in the Alpha and Omega franchise, the fine people at Crest Animation don't have two ideas to rub together. The second movie had Rothbard's partner, the third movie had Rothbard's mentor, so it only makes sense that they would bring back Rothbard's ghost for no reason whatsoever. And for the love of God, do these people not know how to make anything walk? The feet are supposed to be firmly planted, not sliding all over the place. For that matter, why even involve this cat in the first place? Is it really impossible for Rothbard to possess a human to do his bidding? Don't move. If you use your face, so. Right in a one horse open sleigh. <laughs> Christmas has the best holiday music, don't you think? Where'd that pop music come from? Christmas has the best holiday music, don't you think? Much better than Pumpkin Awareness Day. <gasps> pumpkin Awareness Day? Are they not allowed to say Halloween? Are there raging hordes of pumpkins roaming the countryside? Are pumpkins a deadly disease? Why do we need to be aware of pumpkins? And that cat's dead. Sorry, Rothbart, your plan failed already. Shoo, little fella. Shoo. Go on. That was kind of creepy. And you're kind of a bitch. Why aren't you rushing out to help that poor thing? That was kind of creepy. On the other hand, he did stop us in the right spot. <laughs> Mistletoe. No, those are grapes. Mistletoe is white, you idiots. And you think of making out because this poor frozen cat nearly died in the middle of the road. How romantic! Everybody zing! Over the river and through the woods to you bet us how sweet go! Oh yeah, Jean Bob here is supposed to be French, but this movie can't make up its mind if he's French or German. Back at their castle. Cookie. Oh, I can't! <laughs> you better told me to blow the horn the very moment I see Derek slay. <laughs> You've used up all my pucker! Oh, I can't blow the horn if I've lost my pucker! I'm not touching that one because... I can't! I mean, I can't blow my horn if I've lost my pucker? What can I add to that? Silly puppy! Smoochie give you extra pucker! Oh, come on! Seriously? Playing our song. Yeah, those have to be one of Lord Roger's inventions. And just look at the swans. <laughs> now that's all, Mom. Every year she chooses a Christmas theme, and this year it's a Swan Princess Christmas. Roll credits. As they haul the castle facade off the set, the staff continues their Christmas decorating. You get to carry the royal star. Oh yes, so royal. It's the same star that that Mexican Canadian Indian had in Alpha and Omega 2. Rothbard's ghost leads number nine here into the basement, where he finds a crate with a big R on it that is meant for Derek to open. Somehow, Derek opening this thing will get Rothbard a living body once again, and I need to repeat, none of this was brought up before now! Even if Rothbard had a plan B for himself in the event of his death, why hasn't he done anything with it before now? And why is Derek's mom's head made of rubber? That's not how you apply squash and stretch! Speaking of animation, for God's sake, be consistent with motion blur. 
If you need to have these characters jerking around like this instead of giving real performances, fine, whatever. But life forces us to sit through all this horrible strobing. Granted, applying more motion blur is only going to take longer for the movie to render, but trust me, it's fine. We'll wait. It's Christmas! Hooray! More pop music! You want to know what 19th century pop music really sounded like? Get a lot of black people and Latinos in Russia. <laughs> Wait, what? Where'd that confetti come from? She's a witch! Burn her! <laughs> hey kids, what's the easiest way to date your movie? Auto tune! Ugh, after that auditory molestation, the Queen gives Odette the task of arranging her own musical number for their Christmas celebration. What about Odette makes the Queen think that she's capable of something like that? And why did they give her Santa's naughty and nice list to help her accomplish this task? Later in Barbie Pinklandia, we see Derek looking for a Christmas tree, and he's doing this with a snowboard. Snowboard. Roger's latest invention. A snowboard! Then he uses the snowboard to help fend off some kind of saber-tooth leopard. What? You didn't know that saber-tooth cats are still around? Because saber-tooth cats are totally still around! <laughs> nice and safe. <laughs> oh my god, they're gonna cross paths with Humphrey, aren't they? Seriously, is it just impossible for these people to make a movie that doesn't involve log sledding? Just make it part of your company logo already! So they kill the leopard, which ends up being completely pointless and unnecessary. Thank you, movie! Then we jump to the royal ice rink, which the help uses during their breaks? Then Derek comes back with a tree that he can only find after killing a wild animal, and probably leaving a litter of cubs to die alone in the cold. Nice! Instead of lighting the tree with candles, this year please consider my newest invention. I call it... The light bulb. You did not invent the light bulb! Now that they have the royal tree, the next day is Ornament Day. They have a big song to explain to us what Ornament Day is, and they need to sing this song to Odette so that we're privy to what it is, even though it makes no sense that she wouldn't know what Ornament Day is. Later, number nine leads Derek into the basement and tricks him into opening Rothbart's box, which in turn releases Rothbart's ghost. Now that he's free, he can proceed with his master plan of destroying Christmas. Because it's not about ruling the kingdom like it was in the first movie, it's about destroying Christmas. Yeah, they say that destroying Christmas cheer will allow him to be more powerful, but really? There wasn't any reason he could try pulling this off at some earlier point in the year when Christmas cheer would be in shorter supply? Anyway, he influences Rogers and the Queen to be at each other's throats, which ultimately results in absolutely nothing. Just like Winterbolt from Rudolph and Frosty's Winter Wonderland, Rothbard has the power to affect minds, and rather than use that power to make his enemies shoot themselves in the face, he just makes them kind of cross during the holidays. Our villain, ladies and gentlemen. Derek spots Rothbard trying to haunt the castle elsewhere, but notices his strange reaction to a set of wind chimes. <laughs> Are you sure? I heard him. I saw him. The chimes made him visible. They seemed to hold him. Yes, because they represent Christmas. Wind chimes do not represent Christmas! This movie could have done something intelligent by explaining to us that, like jack-o'-lanterns, wind chimes can be used to ward off evil spirits. But nope! They hold Rothbart because he's weakened by Christmas spirit, and wind chimes represent Christmas. Fuck you, movie. Look at Odette's face right here. Not even she can believe that he said something that's stupid. Derek then hangs a bunch of wind chimes all over the castle, like someone warding off vampires would hang garlands of garlic. Rothbart flies out of the castle to try to ruin Christmas elsewhere. I don't see what the point is. The longer this music goes on, the more it'll just ruin itself. Done. 
<laughs> Arsenio Hall was not a thing in 19th century Russia! And then they whip out a couple of lightsabers. There's no mention of them being sorcerers themselves, or how they're technologically adept to the point where they can make lightsabers. They just have lightsabers now because funny. Of all the times for me to be without booze. Odette hijacks some kids from the local orphanage to sing in her performance. And by local orphanage, I mean remote building in the middle of nowhere. I know just the song I want you to learn. It goes something like this. Christmas is the reason for the season when Jesus Christ was born. Because Russian Baptist revival music was a thing, right? We later find that giant Judy puppet from before stumble across Rothbart. <gasps> Look, it's me. <gasps> Rothbart? Oh, <gasps> you big naughty! The first thing that she says upon recognizing him is, "You big naughty." Is he one of her playthings too? Rothbart, you big naughty boy. Gosh, I missed ya so much. Bridget missed those days too. <laughs> well, maybe Bridget and Big Naughty work together again. I don't want to know what that means. Meanwhile, Rogers and the Queen are still trying to one-up each other. Ugh, why don't they just whip it out and measure it already? That's what Bridget and Big Naughty are doing. I hate you so very, very much. I know. He gets Bridget here to cut down all the wind chimes, leaving him free to roam about the castle. He then orders number nine to get one of the light bulbs off of the Christmas tree, because of course he knows about this crazy new invention that no one's ever heard of before. But Odette's animal friends chase him down, only to get captured and be rendered even more useless than they were before. Not entirely sure how you do that. Anyway, Rothbart does a little magical hoo-ha that'll make the bulb blow up the Christmas tree. Because simply lighting the tree on fire is too easy, right? So the big night of the Christmas Eve pageant has arrived, and Bridget leads Rothbart into a trap made of giant wind chimes that Derek built. So... she was working with Derek as a spy this whole time, but don't ask me how this is supposed to work. I honestly can't remember these two ever talking to each other, let alone conspiring to take Rothbart down. It's too late, little prince. When Christmas is destroyed, you and Swan Chica are next. You don't know the word Chica. You have no reason to say the word Chica. Why did you refer to Odette as the Swan Chica? So the pageant begins, and I know I've been bitching about the music a lot in this review already, but listen to this. God, this is horrific! The rest of it's been bad enough, but do you really expect us to believe that that is what a little girl sounds like? Save us, Caitlin Mayer! for saving Christmas. Again. After the music mercifully comes to an end, they then light the Christmas tree, Christmas tree goes boom, and this somehow restores Rothbart to life. Um... Okay. If he could always use his ghostly magic to do that, why didn't he just do that before now? Did he need the Christmas tree for this to work? If he needs a Christmas tree to carry out his plan, then why has he been trying to destroy Christmas this whole time? Why doesn't anyone at Chris Animation actually read their scripts before animating? Ugh, anyway, he poofs onto the stage, takes the crown for himself, and takes Odette with him back to his old castle on Swan Lake. Oh, now, that's what I call curb appeal. It just screams comfort and luxury in a quiet rural setting. But a little cute for my taste. You like? I'd call it gothic chic. 
And anyone who calls that gothic chic is an idiot. Gothic architecture and decor is supposed to be heavenly in nature. It has tall, pointed windows and archways that direct the eye up towards the heavens. It's supposed to be ornate and beautiful to show off the glory of God. Granted, the word gothic has been twisted over the years, but in the late 1800s, you're still supposed to appreciate it for its beauty, not for being dark and dilapidated. He turns Odette into a swan again. Seriously, turn it into something new, like a rock or something. Her animal friends bust out to try to help her, but he turns Puffin into a Christmas tree ornament. Oh, my own first Christmas ornament. I'm going to celebrate the destruction of Christmas by hanging my first Christmas ornament. Wait, what? Derek shows up, and then Rothbard turns into that giant bat monster that he turned into from the first movie. If you can turn into a giant demon bat thing, why do you care about whether or not people celebrate Christmas? But oh no, Derek's been defeated. How will Odette get out of this one? Get this. She sings a Christmas song, and that's all it takes to destroy a Rothbart and undo his spells. But we're not done being abysmally stupid yet. Derek actually dies, I think. But singing a Christmas song is enough to bring him back, too. I can't hear your heart beating, but I know you still hear me. Great! Now we got aliens! Now we got aliens? This is supposed to be the emotional climax of the movie! Why would you want to ruin it with something as stupid as that? Why not just throw in an, I have to pee, while you're at it? Oh, thank you, aliens. Then the Christmas tree is restored as well, because pushing the idea that Christmas means more than pretty decorations would just be silly. They play more horrible music, and Christmas is saved. I am so happy. So that was the Swan Princess Christmas, and it really makes you feel the Christmas spirit. Again, why does this movie exist? Who is asking for more Swan Princess, and who is asking for a Christmas movie with these characters? The animation is ugly, the vocal performances are phoned in, the main characters are as bland as ever, the secondary characters are bizarre, the fact that they had to bring Rothbard back when the other sequels were doing fine without him just reeks of desperation and the music. Oh my god, the music! You have a property that's based on a ballet by Tchaikovsky. You set one of its sequels during the Christmas season. Why not incorporate the Nutcracker into the soundtrack? Oh, that's right. You can't do that because that would actually be kind of clever and make some kind of sense. No, let's put in a bunch of R&B and soul music and then auto-tune the ever-loving shit out of it. That fits in with 19th century Russia, doesn't it? With 2017 coming to a close and the new year rapidly approaching, all I can do is hope that I won't see anything as stupid as this for a long time. See you later, and have a happy new year.
I hate you so very, very much. No, you don't. Subscribe. Like. Follow. Comment.